All right, so this is part three of uh, All About Service Dogs. Now, this part is about you. If you're thinking about getting a service dog and you have questions about it, it, will you be a good owner or will, you know, will all that fit in my circumstances? So let's go. I found a good questionnaire, good questionnaire to think about, to reflect about. Uh, and so let's go through it. This questionnaire comes from Can Do Canines. Uh, so I want to acknowledge uh, their work. So it's called Can Do Canines Assistance Dogs. All right, so here are some questions that are good for you to reflect about. Service dogs still are still dogs. <laughs> so you got to remember that. You know, a dog loves the attention. The dog loves to play. They like to walk. They like to eat, of course, and they sleep a lot. So that it, they're not robots. They just, you know, they're not going to read your mind. <laughs> so, so that's really important. Service dogs are highly trained and dependable in a variety of situations, but they are still dogs, living, breathing animals. So uh, that's really important to keep into consideration. Training never ends. So they might get all the basic trainings and all the training that the dog needs to serve you. However, you need to continue to practice those skills with them uh, throughout their lifetime. It needs to be reinforced and it needs to be um, practiced with them throughout their lifetime. So you need, I would do like 10, 15 minutes of training every day with Johnny, my service dog. And he loved it. I made it fun. You know, he would get treats um, or his favorite toy. So, you know, every time he did a task correctly. Service dogs are expensive, which they are. They cost about twenty to thirty thousand dollars to train them for those two years that they are in training. So, the agencies what they do is they ask you to participate in helping with raising funds for the dog, or they might have their own donors and they might ask the donors to uh, look at this particular person who needs a service dog. Would they be willing to support the training? You know, for this person and the service dog. So um, it, it is expensive. So uh, keep that in mind. People will be very curious at best. <laughs> so people will react differently. You know, some people absolutely adore dogs and, and they're fine seeing you in public. Other people are scared of dogs and um, are horrified that you're in a food store with, with a service dog. Other people are allergic. Uh, children especially, they come running up to the dog and they'll, you know, pet the dog or just stare at the dog or, you know, um, you know, and their parents might have to grab them or say, no, you can't pet that dog because it's, it's a specialized dog or a working dog. So kids have a hard time understanding that. So um, they might have a dog, you know, at home that looks just like yours. <laughs> so... Um, so they might try to pet your service dog, climb on them, throw things, yell, scream, make kissing, kissy noises and hand gestures, or even try to feed your dog. So you have to be prepared for those things. And it's one of the reasons why I had a, a vest on my service dog that said, please, no petting, you know, working dog, service dog. I had service dog on it and you know I had patches all over the place please don't please don't please don't <laughs> so and Jenny Johnny was fine he loved people but he also knew when he was with me he had to focus so so he was very good at that service dogs are not a cure so you have to keep your own skills up you know if you have mobility issues um, or dexterity issues you still have to depend on your own tools to continue to help yourself, you know, because you don't know a day that the dog, you know, might get sick. You might have to take him at the vet, you know, all that kind of stuff. So uh, a service dog isn't a magical fix, you know. In fact, if it sometimes makes life much harder, everything takes more time. You'll have to deal with uh, constant attention, and you are now responsible for another life, 
and all that goes with it. So yes, so it'll be you, but it'll also be the service dog who depends on you, depends on you for the walks, depends on you for food, depends on you for playtime, fun time, training time. So your schedule just got a little bit more complicated. And you have to figure that in, in terms of work, if you work full time or part time, you know how all that will will uh, figure in to what you need to do for a service dog. And I always tell people it's like having a two year old <laughs> in the house, and you constantly, you know, have to be working with them. Not only your schedule, but the dog's schedule as well. You represent the service dog community, so y you have to also be as professional as possible and as dignified and proud of having your service dog in, in public and you are be constantly educating people over and over because I had a lot of people who would approach me and ask me, oh, your dog is so beautiful, you know, where did you get them and how did you get them? Um, you know, all those questions are going to be thrown at you. So you have to educate yourself well about the ADA, which I've said in other um other videos so you know all of this will will be also people will approach you a lot so if you're a strong introvert <laughs> you just became an extrovert <laughs> so in the united states we are blessed to be protected by laws that make having a service dog very accessible to those who need need them we enjoy every generous access rights if we want, if we want it to stay that way, we need to hold ourselves to the absolute highest standards possible. Let's not give any governing body a reason to step in and restrict our freedoms. So that's really important. Um, other countries don't have the laws that we have. So if you plan to travel with your service dog, Keep that in mind. You need to check out that country and what regulations are going to uh, help you or protect you. You know, if you travel to another country, they're thinking about animals or dogs. It's very different. So just keep that in mind. All right. The next question, be prepared for access challenges. As I said in other videos, you know, someone might be, you know, a foreigner or somebody might um, just not like service dogs or just doesn't care about service dog rights. So um, there is a whole section of questions and answers that you can take a look at. Um, I had more people on the positive side than on the negative side. Uh, but usually it happened with people challenging me. Uh, like, you shouldn't be in this store with that dog. <laughs> I said, sorry, it's a service dog. You see his vest, you see his plaque. So he's a service dog and he stays with me. So, and you know, I had a manager who kind of, Johnny turned around and he, his tail um, bumped to some kind of plastic container. And so I picked it up and put it on the shelf. But the manager interpreted that as um, uh, an opportunity to, to kick me out. Um, because he challenged me in a, very nasty way, you know, I didn't want to stay there anyway. I wasn't going to purchase things anyway, but um, if I had to go back into that store, I would have challenged him. So, and I was prepared for that. So anyway, take notes and make sure your support system knows the laws as well. If you encounter a situation having someone who can step in and back you up will make a huge difference. Practice what you might say in front of a mirror so you are prepared as possible. So I had, again, I had more, um, more of the positive than the negative, which, which is good to hear, you know, that a lot of people are educated in terms of service dogs and what they can do for you. So you are not required to carry an ID or other proof. And that is very true. You can have your dog without a vest and without a, a placard uh, with nothing. So, um, and, you know, I still strongly support anybody using a service dog to use a vest. 
Um, however, you don't have to. Um, in their service animals, questions and answers, the DOJ explicitly says that, that no special registration or ID is necessary for service dog handlers to be granted public access. Covered entities may not require documentation, such as proof that the animal has been certified, trained, or licensed as a service animal as a condition for entry. There are individuals and organizations that sell service animals certification or registration documents online. These documents do not convey any rights under the ADA, and the Department of Justice does not recognize them as proof that the dog is a service animal. So, so this is really important. You know, we've had this conversation among people who have service animals, and I think we prefer to have some kind of service or service dog registration at this point, I think it would help, you know, to reduce. I don't think it'll eliminate, but it will reduce the struggles that sometimes we go through. So um, keep that in mind, what side of the fence you might be on. Um, I would prefer that it would be a registration, that the dog go through a full training and then he is recognized and certified, but other people are against it, so uh, for their uh, own reasons. Though the law states service dogs can wear anything you want or even nothing at all, we as an ADI organization require dogs to wear an identifying vest or cape. So I think the ADI uh, stands for Association of Dogs International, I think. So there's a national, international organization that, you know, that the dog trainers for service dogs respond to a bigger organizations and they have to comply with certain criteria. So. So many handlers don't know that their service dog is not required to wear any special gear, whether it be a harness, vest, patches, or other, otherwise. It is true that it can make life easier and lets those around you know from afar that your dog is working and not to be bothered. Keywords can Many people seem to um, have vest, patch, blindness, and will attempt to pet or distract your dog, no matter how many neon <laughs> signs you have on, on the gear. So it, it is true. And I had issues with children more than anything else. Um, sometimes a parent had wanted to educate their child, so they would approach me, oh, can, can we talk about your service dog? I want to educate my kids about this. So you do a lot of educating and um, in terms of, and again, if you're an introvert, this is going to be a little bit challenging, but um, might take five minutes out of your time to, uh, and you could be polite about it. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'd love to do this and let's meet again. I have to go to a doctor's appointment and I don't want to be late or something like that. So uh, it can be that kind of uh, answer, you know, and it, you might be running late. You have to get to your next appointment, and you have three people who want to ask you about your service dog. So just be aware that that will happen. A service dog is not always the best option. So some people, you know, you have to reflect, it. would I be a good owner? Will I have the money to support a service dog in my life? Will I, be, will I be a tolerable to people approaching me and asking questions or little kids running up and grabbing my dog's butt, you know, or their tail or, you know. <laughs> so will you have the patience? Will you have the time? Will you have the energy? So just as a service dog isn't a cure, it isn't always the best choice for mitigating your disability. We can't emphasize how important it is to have a healthcare professional 
and an experienced trainer involved when you are making the decision to get a service dog. These two people can help determine whether the pros of a service dog outweigh the cons for you and if the dog can be trained to m mitigate your specific disability. And you also got to remember that a dog's not going to live forever, and that's going to be very painful when they die uh, or have to be put down. Um, it's going to be very hard for the dog if your disability changes or gets worse, and uh, then the dog has to change owners um, or go back to just being a pet. So it's some of that and all of that, as I say. So you really need to reflect, is this an option for me or not? And just be honest with yourself. Activities will take more time. So yeah, so when you want to go on a trip, you have to pack your things, but you also have to pack for the dog. <laughs> so you have to think of those things. Or when you're trying to get out the door to go somewhere, or to join some friends for some fun activities. You have to pack for yourself, but you also have to prepare the service dog for whatever you're going with. Now, you know, I took Johnny out camping. Uh, he flew in an airplane with me. Uh, what else, any big trips? Um, when my family came to visit me, we went to the Grand Canyon, we traveled. Um, to my surprise, my my brother loves dogs, and he uh, and Johnny knew it. And so uh, when we got to the hotel, <laughs> Johnny declared it was playtime. <laughs> so, because <laughs> he had been cooped up in the car the whole day. So um, he started jumping from bed to bed, and so then I had to calm him down because he usually, when he ate, and he did, you know, a lot of physical jumping around. He would throw up, <laughs> which is exactly what he did. <laughs> so I said to my brother, please don't get him riled up because he will throw up, especially because he had just eaten. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so you have to be prepared for those, those moments. And, and Johnny just had a very sensitive stomach. So, so I, I really wanted him to be cool and calm and, and not jump all over the place like a goat. <laughs> so, yeah, chances uh, are you'll be stopped by curious passerbyers uh, when running your errands. <laughs> exactly what would happen to me all the time. What would normally be a five-minute trip to the get milk could easily turn into 30 minutes excursions filled with questions, comments, oohs, and ahs about what a cute puppy. <laughs> Can I pet your dog? What's wrong with you? <laughs> Etc. Checking out will take twice as long because a cashier would undoubtedly strike up a conversation. <laughs> so all those things happen to me. It's your job to protect your dog. So... The service dogs, and this is an important statement, because the service dog will not be trained to protect you. They, they have that bred out of them. So they never should be growling, and they should never be barking. Although, you know, barking while they're playing is just fine, but they're not trained to protect you. That is not the task of a service dog. They have to have that bred out of them. So... Throughout the training, they put them in situations uh, in, in which it looks like the dog is going to be attacked and he should never, never respond. The service dog should never, ever respond to aggressiveness or somebody yelling at you, never. So it'll be important for you to protect the dog. Um, so that's, that's really important. You might say, but I want my dog to protect me. And that is the wrong perception of a service dog so they can't be in that protective mode just like your service dog helps to keep you safe uh, in the medical sense not by being protective it's your responsibility to keep them safe this means dressing them in protective gear when the weather or situation calls for this could be special boots doggy eyewear or coat 
when traveling, you'll need to use a safety harness or a sturdy crate to protect your service dog in the event of an accident. So when they're, and that's very true, when you're in a car, um, it's really important for them to be, uh, as we have safety belts, uh, seat belts, they also need a seat belt in the car always. Even though they're trained to lie down or stay still in the car, um, it's really important to have them in a seat belt. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I had Johnny in, in a seatbelt always. He didn't quite like it. Every time the car stopped, he would jump into the first, into the passenger seat. Um, you know, so those first months I was with Johnny, he, um, <clears throat> he was very good about lying down. I didn't even have to say it to him. He would get in the car and lie down right away. But then later I learned, you know, he just... Uh, would be really happy about, you know, getting up and it's like, oh, we arrived, let's see what we're gonna do. So, <laughs> and sometimes in traffic, I would have to slow down or stop abruptly and, and Johnny would hit the deck. <laughs> so, so I felt bad for him. So then I would, you know, put him in a harness in the car. So, so that's important. Our service dogs will push themselves far past their capacity as far as what is safe and healthy. They want to please us and don't understand the consequences of their actions. One of the wonderful things about service dogs is that they are selfish, selfless, and devoted. And we have to be sure not to take advantage of that. It's our job and responsibility responsible handlers to put the needs of our service dogs first. Keep your service dog fit, so don't over feed them, you know. Um, it's really important to find a uh, good nutritional food that is low in fat, you know. They will be by your side and resting a lot and sleeping a lot, so um, if they don't get enough exercise, if you know they're eating food that is not very healthy, they're gonna put on a lot of weight and that's not good for the service dog. Uh, it's not good for their health. So it's important to keep them lean and fit. So have them at a good weight. And when you see the vet, they're gonna wanna uh, weigh your dog and see how things are going. So keep them fit as a fiddle. <laughs> Only only an elite few have what it takes. Being a, service, being a service dog is a very demanding job. It isn't just a matter of being pretty, well-behaved in public, and making their handler feel better by being around. A service dog must have the temperament and training to be reliable in absolutely every situation uh, they may encounter. If a small child runs up to them and grabs a service dog in the face, they must be able to tolerate it and not be phased. A service dog needs to be able to focus completely on their handler with hot bacon cooking nearby or if a dog in heat is in the vicinity. If their handler becomes unconscious, they should maintain their training and be 100% trustworthy. Now, this is really true. Um, my service dog had been with me only for five months. And we had just come back from a long trip from Phoenix up to Sholo, which is where I was working. And, um, you know, I took Johnny for a walk so he can stretch. He was in the car all day. And so um, then... Um, he had already eaten because I would feed him early around like five o'clock, between four and five. So Johnny had a tight schedule. I don't know how they got that into him, but nine o'clock, that was his time to go to bed. No matter what was happening, boom, Johnny would go to bed. And so we got home around 8.30 or so. So I got him, I walked him around a little bit so he could stretch and go to the bathroom and do whatever he needed to do sniff around and then I you know went in the house and took his leash off and his vest off 
And then he knew, you know, he could do whatever he needed to do. So he went to bed. That was it. So I was watching the news, the 9 o'clock news, and Johnny came out and stood in front of me. <laughs> so I was like, okay, Johnny, what's up? Do you need something? You want some water? You know, which I usually didn't give him too much water at night so we wouldn't get up during the night needing to go out. But um, he just kind of rolled his eyes. He had a way of rolling his eyes, and he, then he just went back in the room and went to bed. And then um, he, a few minutes later, he came out charging and was running around in circles in front of me like a crazy Looney Tune. And I had no idea what running around in circles meant. <laughs> so I thought, what is wrong with Johnny? Because he, 9 o'clock he would go to bed and that would be the end. But he was in front of me running around in circles, desperate for something. And I couldn't figure it out. So I called his trainer and I said, um, and I said, uh, you know, Johnny is in front of me running around in circles. He just, he, he's like, like a madman. I don't know what's going on. She said, be careful because something might be going on. He's trying to alert you to, uh, running out, running around in circles did, doesn't mean anything, but if he's desperate, it's because danger is nearby. So be careful. So I got a little worried and, but I said, you know, I didn't hear anything. So I said, Johnny, do you want to go to bed? And he just kind of looked at me and stared at me like, nope, that's not, nope. <laughs> so I said, okay, look, this is what I'll do. I'll turn off the TV. I'll go to the door. And he knew the word door. So when I said door, he just kind of stomped the ground with his paws. <laughs> but, okay, that's weird. But I said, okay, I'll go check the door and I'll make sure the gate is locked, and then we'll go to bed. How's that? And he just kind of, you know, stomped on the ground again. So I got up, and I opened the door to check the gate, and there was this big glow outside, um, and I thought, is somebody barbecuing at this hour? So um, I took a few steps down, and um, in the driveway, our public dumpster was on fire, and I mean on fire. The flames were so high that it was reaching the electric wires above. It was spilling over the dumpster. It was just a mess. And on the, right on the other side of our fence were these our neighbors who had working trucks, and the fire was spilling over on that end. I was so scared, so I ran back in the house like a crazy Looney Tune, and I grabbed the phone, I called 911, and I said, look, I can't hear you because I was very hearing impaired th at that time. But my dumpster here at our complex is is on fire. Here's the address. And please come immediately. And she said, your trash can is on fire? I said, no, the dumpster, the general dumpster for the whole complex. She said, oh. So she said, I'll send, you know, a unit right away. And like in three, our town is very small. So in three minutes, the fire department was there, the police department was there, and they were putting on really specialized gear and not the usual gear that they use you know special masks and helmets and I said to the police officer I said why are they putting on all that special gear he said don't you hear it and I said no I'm deaf <laughs> if you were deaf how did you know about the fire I said this this dog that's right here with me he's a service dog he alerted me about the fire so the running around in circles he could hear the explosions in the dumpster because someone, you know, how people throw cans and, and paint and stuff in, in the dumpster. So it was exploding all over the place. So the fire department was trying to protect themselves from the explosions. And um, the police officer, you know, really admired Johnny because if we had left that dumpster on fire, it would have destroyed our neighbor's trucks. It would have caught fire to the dry grass that was around it. It was a mess. So to be 100% reliable, Johnny did his job, even though he didn't know what signal to use, because usually he was trained to, um, if the smoke detectors went off, he was trained to go on my bed, to jump on my bed and, and wake me up. Um, but I was awake. I wasn't in bed, and there was explosions <laughs> going on. 
outside my apartment, which I didn't hear. And uh, so he knew he had to do something, and he did. He got my attention. So um, that is, you know, service, service dogs are trained to think on their own and to try to problem solve, and so to the best of their ability. And that's what Johnny did. That's what service dogs do. They have a unique way of thinking and, and problem solving. So, um, so this the Johnny used his. This is an emergency, and I got to get her attention. I don't know how I'll do it, but I'll do it. <laughs> so, and so that's that's great, and that's what a service dog really does. That's how they think on their own to problem solve for you. Having a service dog is hard. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes you don't feel well. You know, and I got sick a couple of times. It's one of the reasons why I came to the conclusion. I had Johnny for four years, um, but I had to let go because I get sick. I, when I get sick, I get very sick. And sometimes I end up in the hospital, and then, then what? What happens to Johnny? You know, somebody has to take care of him. Somebody has to walk him, feed him. And, you know, that was kind of an issue. So Johnny was good for me for four years, but then, you know, he had to be passed on to someone else. So having a service dog can be hard, you know. You'll have to deal with potty training, puppy biting, jumping, and taking your dog to training classes and out to socialize them. Service dogs are expensive and bring with them attention from the public and access challenges. It will take you far longer to complete any errands. Service dogs are dogs and you will probably have to clean up messes and be embarrassed by them in public. If you have physical limitations, which I do, you will still need to find ways to exercise and care for your dog in order to keep them as healthy as possible. Having a training and training a service dog is physically demanding, which is true. Service dogs are a lot of work. Don't fool yourself into thinking otherwise. So that's something you have to really evaluate for yourself. You may not bond immediately, so and that's okay. So there are methods that the schools for service dogs have to help you bond with your service dog. And it might not click, you know. I was so surprised that after five months, you know, Johnny was very in tune to my needs. You know, whether the phone rang or I left the water running, he would alert me to those things. Like, go shut off the water, you silly. <laughs> then he would roll his eyes and <laughs> walk away. <laughs> he was very expressive and very funny. Educate yourself and others. So information is powerful. You can't exercise your rights if you don't know what they are. So that's why I'm doing these videos. So you can be educated. If you have a hard time reading, the video is, is good to um, just listen, to just listen and reflect. You know? Many people believe that the laws governing the use of service dogs in the United States need to be changed to help cut down on fakers. What these folks don't realize is that the issue isn't the laws. It's that people don't know, don't even know what they are. They are sadly lacking in education in this area. So that's true. And we also have um, people who want to take their pets everywhere, just like service dogs. And that causes us a problem. Um, because then a restaurant might have an incident because it wasn't really a service dog and cut up in the restaurant and made a scene. And then, you know, the manager or the owner of the restaurant might be very cautious the next time a real service dog comes in. So, so again, you need to educate yourself of the, the positives and the negatives. Need before breed. So a lot of people decide in their heads what breed they want, and that doesn't work. It's what dog is really responsive to a particular training. They have to pick out what dog is good for caring, 
that is curious, that can respond to sounds. Other dogs don't care of any noise or anything, but they love picking things up. They love, you know, that playful type of, oh, these keys, I'll pick them up, you know, and then they have that gift. So they really have to pick out a dog that is responsive to those particular tasks they need to learn. So when choosing a service dog prospect, breed is a huge factor. Uh, breeds have been selected for generations to amplify specific traits for specific jobs, whether it be aloofness, retrieving, swimming ability, herding instinct, protectiveness, or otherwise. These traits will show through in the end. You must not get sucked into choosing a, pers a prospect based on looks or even or or a color or whatever breed is your favorite above all a service dog needs to mitigate your disability which is very true they need to possess the necessary traits to work in public and handle all sorts of situations even though the zippy sports car looks great and is impressive it wouldn't be the right choice for a family with four young children. A Belgian Melanois might look impressive and sound fun to train, but it is not a good choice for a disabled individual with little training background that is stuck in bed most of the day. An Australian Shepherd or German Shepherd might be gorgeous and very in tune with their handler, but they aren't the best choice for those, for those prone to anxiety or psychiatric disabilities. Choose a dog that meets your needs as a service dog above all else. If they also happen to be a breed that you love, great. If not, that's okay. Rest assured that you are making the right choice for your health and well-being. So that's true. They use mixed breeds. And um, no matter what the dog looks like, it's all in the brains and what they can handle. Owner training is risky, and I believe that. Because if, if, if you're not, if you don't have the energy for it, if, if, if you have an individual train your service dog and you have no idea their background or if if you start to train the dog and then you get sick and you're in the hospital and then you come back and the dog has forgotten the first task it, it's it's risky you know so it to me it is much better that an organization take that responsibility of getting the best dog for you and getting the the training uh, and consistent training from that organization. So, and finding the right one. You know, uh, I had a friend who chose a dog because he was cute and he was, he was big. He was going to be a, it was a Great Dane lab mix. But he inherited, unfortunately, the brains of, of the Great Dane. <laughs> Great Danes are not known for their smartness. <laughs> so... They're cuddly, they're playful, but they don't have many brains. So it, it, the training for um, that dog was, was very difficult, and he really did not learn his tasks very well. He barked a lot. Um, he was very large, but that was about it. So you have to pick the right dog. You really do. And Johnny did not have it in them in him to to help her uh my friend so it was sad but um you have to pick the right dog not so much the breed slow is fast whether you are training your own service dog or getting a fully trained dog from a program take it slow and that's very true everyone wants to rush out immediately and start taking their service dog prospect Everywhere they go, it's easy to make mistakes, subtle body language that indicates stress, sleeping, yawning, or being still or stiff, etc., as signs of being relaxed. 
take the time to set firm foundations. It isn't a race. Most dogs that are puppies, prodigies, and end up burning out or developing behavior problems that lead to early retirement, which is really sad. And it breaks their heart. Learn to be patient and take some time to build your relationship, which is what Johnny and I did. Um, I didn't take him out in the public until, you know, weeks later. Um, and he was, he was fine. He, he, we really bonded pretty quickly, but that's not always. Some people won't approve. You're going to have people who say, no, you shouldn't do it, you know. Um, family will always have their opinions. And uh, so you, you, family, friends, you know, you might find that you lose some of your old friends or become uninvited to family events if you want to bring the dog with you. <laughs> This can be an extremely painful thing to go through. Obviously, you will need to decide what is best for you in your situation and which battles are worth fighting. So um, I had a good friend, and she would invite me when I was out in Arizona. She would invite me to great trips. We would go out to forests or parks, and, and Johnny loved it. You know, he always behaved. He knew he had his vest on. Um, <laughs> As a golden, he loved swimming. And he was with me at a park, and there was a big pond right there. But he knew he couldn't jump in. He was, he was working. So <clears throat> he would look at me to get permission to put his, his face in the water. <laughs> he was so funny about it. So he would put his face in the water. I would give him permission. He would blow bubbles. <laughs> and so... He was such a goofball. So, and I really didn't take him to dog parks because I was always worried about him, you know, catching some kind of illness for another dog. So that was my decision. There will be doubts. And there were. <laughs> As with any partnership, you will go through ups and downs with your service dog. If you are owner training and raising your own prospect, you will need to contend with your dog's adolescence in dealing with negative attention and access disputes, you will wonder if it, it's all worth it. So I went through that a couple of times, a few times. <laughs> oh, yeah. So every disabled individual with a service dog has experienced doubts. When you're in the middle of the dark place, it's vital to have the support of those around you which is true. That could come from family, friends, and other handlers in person or online and trainer or a trainer behavioralist. So, so there are people out there who are trained to give you the support when you need it, when you're struggling with the idea of a service dog. So um, you got to reflect, you know, the pros and the cons. Try not to make any big decision without the counsel of a trained professional. They can help you remove emotion from the equation and make an informed choice based on, uh, based off of experiences and years of study. In the meantime, lean on those that love and care about you. You aren't in this alone. So that's important. But again, it's really important to review um, pros and cons about having a service dog so, um, and see if it, it's, there's more pros uh, for you in your life. So I want to thank uh, Can Do Canines Assistance Dogs uh, for this document that they wrote. Um, I'm hoping this is helpful. Uh, this is video number three. Uh, so really go through all the pros and cons, write it down, draw it, I don't care. <laughs> but it's important for you to take out that time to really evaluate if a service dog is a good fit for you and how it will change your life and how it won't change your life. Um, the obstacles, um, the fun times you'll have, uh, the stress that you might go through some uh, days and other days it'll go fine. So. 
um, really important to reflect and to contact a couple of agencies, talk to them about what it is like to have a service dog and um, see if it might be a fit for you. That's really important to take the time to think about that. So thank you everyone for coming. Uh, you could have done this on the phone with another agency, <laughs> but I wanted to have this video out there so and give you some assistance to think and reflect about the pros and cons of having a service dog. So if you have any further questions, feel free to post them down below. I'll be happy to answer them, or I can assist you in referring you to, to an agency to start that dialogue. All right, good luck to you, and I'll see you in the next one.